Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, and exchange of ideas, arts, and culture. Today's session is in collaboration with the Azim Premji University and is titled Civil Services Reforms in India. This is part of the public lecture series presented by Azim Premji University. As the civil services in India face new challenges with the changing political and technological environment, this lecture traces the historical evolution of the civil services reforms undertaken at various stages in its history and its current status. The lecture will also cover the relationship between the civil services and good governance. Today's speaker that we have with us is uh, Additional Secretary, Department of Administrative Reforms, Public Grievances, Government of India, and Director General of the National Center for Good Governance, V. Srinivas. Uh, the context and an introduction will be set by uh, former Chief Secretary Rajasthan and visiting professor Azim Premji University, Bangalore, Dr. C.K. Matthew. The moderator for today is the Director, School of Policy and Governance, Azim Premji University, Sita Ramam Katharala. Uh, the full bios of all the speakers will appear uh, on your chat box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And through the session, uh, if you have any questions, observations, or comments to share, please feel free to use the Q&A box also at the bottom of the Zoom screen. The speakers will address a few of the questions towards the end of the session. And with that, I hand it over to uh, Dr. Sita Ramam for opening comments. Uh, thank you, Lekha. Uh, very good evening, friends, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, BIC members, colleagues from the university and foundation, and esteemed uh, audience. I think it's a, an excellent opportunity for the university and BIC for dealing with uh, an important theme, uh, very a decisive sort of uh, governance question that is being addressed in the civil services reforms. And we are very happy and we are grateful to Mr. Srinivas and Dr. Matthew for agreeing to be the speakers today. The university public lecture series uh, started with the belief that genuine and impactful social change mm -hmm. is possible only through the agency of well-informed, sensitized citizenry. And to that uh, cause and contributing to achieve that purpose, the university organizes pub public lecture series. Um, these lectures have been given in the past by uh, very distinguished people in their professional fields, Nobel laureate uh, scholars, uh, Megasese prize winners or grassroots activists or distinguished academics and administrative service officers. Uh, we therefore, I think, uh, feel very grateful for today's um, important theme of uh, understanding the civil services reforms debate in India uh, two very important uh, civil servants uh, who have, uh, you know, a very long career and a very insightful understanding of the processes of the um, institution. Um, I have the honor and privilege of introducing both of them uh, in some detail. So I venture to do that in quick way um, without um, coming in the way of actual lecture. So Dr. C.K. Matthew, who will introduce the theme uh, in the beginning uh, of the uh, today's discussion, um, is currently uh, visiting Professor Ajim Premji University. We are absolutely proud to have him uh, as a visiting colleague uh, who has already contributed by uh, writing a monograph and publishing it a few months ago on the history of the uh, office of the district collector. Uh, he is a retired administrative service officer of 1977 batch and a former chief secretary of Rajasthan. 
He was also the principal secretary of the chief minister of Rajasthan for five years during 1998 and 2003. After retirement, uh, he was special rapporteur for the Southern States uh, in the National Human Rights Commission. He was also a senior fellow at the Public Affairs Center, Bangalore, where he was the principal author of three annual reports, which the uh, Public Affairs Center publishes as Public Affairs Index, and he is the main author. Dr. Matthew holds a PhD in English Literature, and is the author of four books, including the recently released History of the Evolution of District Officers in India, which I just mentioned about. The main speaker for today uh, is Mr. Uh, v. Srinivas, uh, the additional, uh, sorry, who is an administrative officer uh, of the Rajasthan Kader 1989 batch. He holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from Usmania University. He held several key positions in Rajasthan government as well as the government of India, including uh, the chairperson revenue board, the director general National Archives of India. Uh, he is also an accomplished uh, writer and, and intellectual. Uh, he published two books, um, India's Reforms, uh, Relations with the International Monetary Fund, and Towards the New India, Governance Transformed 2014-2019. And I think both have been received quite well. Uh, Mr. Srinivas is currently the additional secretary of the Department of Personal and Administrative Reforms, Government of India, and is also the director general of National Center for Good Governance. So without much ado, so may I request uh, Dr. Matthew uh, to begin the introduction of the theme for today's session, and that will be followed by uh, Mr. Srinivas' presentation. Uh, and as Lekha mentioned, the question answer we'll keep at the end. I have the privilege and honor of being the moderator and which I suppose will come only at the Q&A uh, level. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Matthew, over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sitaraman. I am uh, thankful to both Bangalore International Center and the Azim Premji University for organizing this discussion. Uh, let me say that this subject is now getting every day critically very, very important. Questions are being asked whether the Indian administrative service is really equipped to deal with issues of a modern India. It was created by a colonial power, basically to look at command and control of a native state, of the native people of our country. Has it changed? Has it reformed? These are questions which Srinivas will ask in much detail to you. Let me only say that my association with Mr. Srinivas goes back maybe almost three decades. We were together in the same Kader, Rajasthan Kader, and I have seen him grow into an officer of, I would say, very superior qualities. He's a very prolific writer, very articulate speaker. And I think we look forward to hearing what he's about to tell us. Now in the present context, the trigger for today's session, I would say is that book which mentioned, mentioned by Mr. Ram, where I tried to describe the historical evolution of the post of the district officer over the last almost 300 years. Let me therefore begin by making a rather controversial statement. We are currently passing through a phase of, I would describe aggressive nationalism, where things that are Indian are praised, accepted, acknowledged, and things that are foreign are rejected. I'm not going to go into details, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. It is in this context that many people have asked the question, that this foreign element, foreign form of government that we have adopted from the British, is it actually good for us? Are we able to manage the aspirations of the people of India through this civil service? And very, very recently in the last two or three years, some very critical, significant books have been published. One by Shashi Tharoor, one by William Dalrymple, who have examined in detail the rape of India 
committed by the British authorities. I, for one, am, am looking at it a little differently. I cannot blind myself to the fact that some of the administrative structures, governance structures left behind by the British have held us in good stead over the last 75 years. It has been handed over to us by the British. We have adopted them. And in the turbulent times of 1947, that was a ready-made structure that we could easily adopt. And if you look at very, very broadly, some of the main contributions of the British, the Westminster form of democracy itself, we have taken from them. The question of the state assemblies and the central assembly, the British had it. And they looked at this country as a federation of such states, state and assembly working together as a federation. The division of work, and I'd like to emphasize this point, the division of work between the center and the state, which we have now enshrined in the seventh schedule, the state list and the union list and the concurrent list, is a creation of the British. And almost verbatim, we have adopted that diarchy, diarchy system into our current form of government. And it is in this context that we should look at the civil service, the cutting edge of civil service being the district and the district collector, and how he has helped in holding the country together through very turbulent times. Look at the district court, the high court, and the Supreme Court. The entire legal hierarchy is a gift of the British. The Indian Penal Court, Criminal Procedure Court, the Civil Procedure Court, the Indian Evidence Act, all of which we follow today have all been given by them. So while I do agree and concede that in commercial terms, for the first part of this period where the British occupied our country, in commercial terms, there was a great depredation of our resources. They were misused, profits were repatriated to the mother country, local trade was not encouraged, and there was huge loss to the entire country as such. But we see a remarkable change happening after 1857, 1858 onwards. And that is the second point I'm about to make, that the history of British India can be broadly divided into three phases. The first phase where the British East India Company was only interested in commercial activities, just making money. The second phase begins in after 1757, when the Battle of Plassey was fought, where a mixture of commerce and governance started working together. Sometimes the commercial aspect would supersede the governance aspect, sometimes the other way around. And from 1757 right down to 1858, when the East India Company was ousted and, and they were told to get back home, and the British government took on the reins of power after the first war of independence. That is the third phase in which I believe all the great important changes took place forming the constitutional structure of our country. So let me just go through some of them very quickly and then I would have, I have completed. I, I, I'm sure that many of you know that on the very last date of 1600, 31st December 1600, Queen Elizabeth I signed the charter for the creation of the East India Company. A group of about 40 or 45 merchants of London gathered together and they formed this committee, formed this group, a commercial group. And from 1600, just within 15 years, that is by 1615, Surat was established. Their first go down and their factories were in Surat. By 1639, they had set up Madras. 1661, Bombay was established. 1690, Calcutta was established. So you can see from 1600 to 1690, the framework of the structure of the East India Company was more or less established, it took 90 years. And I'd like to emphasize here that in this structure, they have already created a bureaucratic hierarchy. I'm raising this point because somewhere in the midst of antiquity, the origins of our civil service can be traced to those posts originally created by the East India Company. You joined as an apprentice, hardly 16 years old, you joined as an apprentice, you rose to the level of a writer, then you rose to, promoted as factor, 
factor word and factory are connected just to just by way of comment then you became a merchant then you became a senior per merchant and during all this time of growth is very interesting to note that these young officers of the company their salary was very very paltry very paltry but they were given a certain percentage of the profit that the company accrued so we can see that it is very very far from governance as we know it today and then came the big war which took place in 1757 the battle of plassey 1757 we go back one year just one year 1756 nawab siraj ud daula had defeated routed the british forces in calcutta and the east india company said we must teach him a lesson and restore our power just within one year battle of plassey was fought and robert clive defeated nawab siraj ud daula in in 1764 a few years later the battle of buxar takes place and 1765 this is the most crucial date for us 1765 something happens called the grant of diwani and i'll try to share a slide here yeah this i hope you can see this yeah so you see this person sitting under an umbrella like structure he is the mughal emperor shah alam the second and he is handing over a paper to sir robert clive where he is authorizing the british east india company to collect taxes on behalf of the east india company overnight the character of the company changes from being merely a profit making institution they have now been first given the very difficult task of governance and by collecting taxes a certain percentage was retained by the east india company and the majority of it was transferred to the mogul emperor why did he do that why did this mogul emperor do that because after the defeat of nawab siraj daula there was a vacuum bengal odisha bihar there was a complete vacuum and the mara and the uh, and the emperor realized that he will have to hand over this power of collecting taxes to that local agency who was very much there and this is the first moment this is that moment i have the date here 12th of august 1765 in the fort at allahabad a formal grant of powers to the british east india company to enter the field of governance now from 1765 onwards up to 1857 when the first war of independence took place there was a merger between the commercial stream and the governance stream by this time the parliament in england had realized the significance of a private company running the fortunes of a country and more and more they passed acts regulating acts to control the activities of the east india company that was the time when enlightenment was taking place people liberal ideas were talking about enlightenment and coming to the conclusion that we cannot let a country be run by a mercantile organization so they put curbs on them control their power and gradually started enhancing the governance and administrative administrative structure which brought about a unified india so just for information in in 1769 just 4 years after the grant of the diwani the first british officers were appointed as supervisors to supervise the collection of taxes and most significantly 1772 warren hastings changed the name of the supervisor to collector first time we hear the word collector is 1772 and he explains the fact that supervisor is just an onlooker collector is somebody who will take action and that is why that name had to be changed so between then and as i said 1857 1858 the government started getting more and more importance i have a quotation here from somebody who worked in the east india company long ago describing the typical district officer and he said that he is i am quoting he is minutely just and inflexibly straight minutely just and inflexibly straight and i believe no public service in the whole world can evince more integrity 
what happened was a transformation of the people working in the field, moving away from commercial and mercantile ambitions, more and more into governance, showing transparency, showing integrity, resolving problems without any partisanship and forming some kind of a governmental system. 1787 to 23, the collectors establishment came more and more into, into permanent footing. And at the height of the British Empire, there were about 250 districts. I have one more small point to make, then I will wind up. The British found the secret for maintaining peace and tranquility in the country was not very difficult. What they did was, we know that the land record system of a country is very old. Much before the British, the land record system was already in place. But what they did was, they went to each plot cultivated by a cultivator and gave that agriculturist a permanency on his tenancy. He was given a document which said, look, this is your land. You have been cultivating it for many years now. Here is a document which says that you are the tenant of the land. And in exchange for a small fee called land revenue, he was given security over the land. And giving that security, the British undertook on themselves the task that they would also provide law and, law and order, bring tranquility. So this connection between land, secure tenancy, land revenue, and law and order, these four, these four items combined so smoothly that they are able to maintain tranquility in our country as a whole. Of course, everything changed with 1857, first war of independence. There was a severe revolt across the country. It took the British about a year to bring back some kind of normalcy. And then the decision was taken. It's time to say goodbye to the East India Company. You go. Now the British Crown, Queen Victoria, through the British Parliament, will provide good governance to you. And I have just uh, one, one factor I wanted to mention. The name of Lord Macaulay, we all know. But Lord Macaulay, we must remember for three things. First, he wrote the Indian Penal Code. It took him 10 years to write it. And that penal code we still follow today. For all our criminal court cases, we still follow penal code. It brings some kind of stability and control and tranquility over the country. Second, he was the one who introduced English in public schools. Otherwise, it was a different languages all across the country, different local languages. He introduced a common one single language in English. Of course, he had his own purposes. It is condemned by many people for other reasons. But the fact that we are now talking to each other in English is probably a result of uh, Lord Macaulay's decision. And third, the purely discretionary appointment into the civil service, which the British East India Company used to do, their sons and nephews and all kinds of relatives used to be appointed without any question. He is the one who said, no, we will now start a competitive process of examination for selection into the Indian civil service. So we must remember Macaulay for these three, three achievements and the way they trained their officers and brought them back for training into India and the way they slowly rose up the bureaucratic hierarchy. These are all, I think, things that we need to remember. So let me just uh, conclude by saying as a backgrounder to Mr. Srinivas, I wanted to cover the period till the beginning of the war, after the War of Independence, till the beginning of British rule in India, British government's rule in India. I had a peak, sneak pre preview of Srinivasan's uh, presentation. I know he begins somewhere around the middle of the 1800s. So roughly it coincides with what I'm saying. So I would now like to hand over uh, to Srinivas and I would also request him to look at this question of the doubts being expressed in civil society about the capability and the competence of the civil service to manage our problems. Can we manage with this old imperial structure that we created 200 years ago? Or do we need a complete revamping of the system so that the aspirations of people are better achieved? Thank you. As soon as I hand over the... Mic. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Matthew. I think that's a very nice sketch that you have provided and the historical context. And um, Mr. Srinivas, your oh, Thanks very much. At the outset, let me thank uh, the Azim Premji University for inviting me for this uh, webinar. 
let me also thank uh, Dr. C.K. Matthew. In fact, I've had the opportunity to serve with him from 1989 till his uh, day of retirement. And of course, even post-retirement, we continue to uh, work together on a number of issues. One thing that has fascinated uh, both of us has been civil service reforms. And it's a passion that we have shared not only uh, throughout Mr. Matthew's career, as also his uh, post-retirement uh, writings and academic work. I have a presentation for the audience. I noticed several distinguished uh, civil servants in the audience. My distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Krishna Srivatsa. I also see uh, several uh, academicians like Professor Rumpi, Basu, Professor Srinivaspati, a number of senior journalists, academicians, I'm deeply privileged that all of you are in the audience today. And uh, let me take you through the presentation that I have for you today. subject is civil service reforms and uh, the uh, the gamut and the time span of this lecture is almost 200 years so in the next 35 40 minutes i'll try and cover 200 years of history of the service and how it has changed and how it has reinvented itself over a period of time to cope with the challenges of uh, modern day governance and this is a quotation from the Second Administrative Reforms Commission, which I thought is most apt to commence this session. In governance is re realized all the forms of renunciation. In governance is combined all knowledge. In governance is centered all the worlds. This is a quote from the Mahabharata, and this is how the second ARC actually starts its reports. The contents of my session today are the Central Secretariat, how it expanded from 1834 to 1947, the establishment of the Indian Civil Service, the first phase of reforms when uh, the service operated largely as uh, uh, one that implemented the socialist model of governance, regulatory governance from 1950 to 1990. Then the big changes that occurred in the post-liberalization era when the shackles of bureaucratic cobwebs were to be removed. And then the reforms in the 21st century from 2000 to 2014. And thereafter, what we witnessed, the massive scaling up of programs in terms of a whole of government approach, digital India, how do you increase efficiency in decision making? And uh, there are also several commonalities uh, over this period, which uh, continue to remain valid in terms of uh, ethics and accountability, which I will touch upon. So let me quickly go through uh, these slides, and it's about 120 slides, so I request your patience as I go through this uh, voluminous and lengthy period. Uh, the Government of India Act of 1833 uh, mandated that the Governor General of Bengal became the Governor General of India, and the two governments had a joint secretariat. And the Government of India started with two departments. We had just had two secretaries. And you compare it with 84 secretaries now, it's a massive expansion in terms of government responsibilities and uh, governance mandate. They largely dealt with important questions of legislation. And that's how the state governments uh, were mandated to deal exclusively with details. The Central Secretariat largely had a Bengali character. It was dominated by Bengali civilians. And uh, it acquired an All India character much later, once the examinations came in in 1855. By 1843, there were four departments in the government of India. That was the military department, there was a foreign office, a home department, and a finance department. And uh, these, over a period of time, have expanded into a number of other uh, departments over in initially from 19 uh, till 1947, and then thereafter, massive expansion. So, uh, as I said, we started with two, uh, two secretaries to the government of India. And thereafter, it became four secretaries to government of India. They were under secretaries to support the secretaries. By 1854, the Governor General of India was separated from the Governor General of Bengal. And the Central Secretariat was reorganized. We had this beautiful public works department building that was created on Rajaji Marg with the secretary from the Corps of Engineers being established. 
the governor general also had members of the executive council who could advise him in the transaction of business and these members were assigned specific departments but the governor general retained the foreign department the home department and the finance uh, retained the foreign department the home and finance were assigned to civilian members and the interaction was with the secretary of state in uh, london there was also a military member and a law member and uh, the members could dispose of papers and return to the secretaries and only papers of greater importance would be put up to the governor general a portfolio system was introduced in 1861 and this mandated that the transaction of business will be carried out by each member on the subjects under his charge between 1862 and 1919 the central secretariat further expanded and a legislative department was created and which corresponded with local governments on legislation and then the home finance departments were divided into revenue agriculture commerce home it was a slightly larger expansion then came the american civil war and the importance of indian cotton exports to england became very important i said recall my years as joint secretary cotton in uh, ministry of textiles and the quantum of interactions with uh, uh, international cotton associations was fairly large and it dates back to 1861 when the manchester cotton association requested for constant supply of cotton from india so the commerce department was entrusted with the mandate of uh, fiber sell commerce and trade and thereafter only 100 years later in 1982 the separate ministry of textiles was created from the commerce ministry uh, severe famine necessitated the creation of an agriculture statistics department and thereafter a separate member was appointed to deal with commerce industry which covers currently many ministries petroleum factories economic products textiles coal mines and uh, iron and steel this was established so uh, the commerce and industry department further bifurcated into the modern day udyog bhavan then uh, the army had two departments a military supplies department which dealt with defense estates and cantonments and there was the army department which dealt with the cadres education came, uh, department was created in 1911 and a railway board in 1905 so Uh, Curzon, when he created education, said that education represents the most complex and momentous branches of government, but it needed a separate sector because it was uh, drifting like a desert hulk on chopping seas. Further expansion happened in terms of a director general of education, and by 1910. Uh, we had eight departments you had the imperial library located in calcutta we had the archaeological survey of india museums was established and many of these institutions continue to this day and the secretaries of the department were responsible for correspondences and careful observance of rules and orders the secretariat works on a huge system of noting how does the system of noting evolve and It was in 1899 that Lord Curzon first wrote a Central Secretariat Manual of Office Procedure, and the British placed a lot of emphasis on the need for a permanent record, which deserved to be uh, preserved in the inherited memory of a department, and it could be used much later in case some new person came in, they could read and learn from past history. So file notes were kept separately, correspondence portion was kept separately, and uh, the Curzon's memorandum of 1899 carries on to this day as the central secretariat manual of office procedures it's the 15th edition which was released in 2019 curzon observed that secretaries deputy secretaries under secretaries and assistant secretaries must write and that is the only way they can prove their metal and validate their abilities to the viceroy so promotions were largely dependent on the acumen with which an official could write a note that is something that's valid to this day the number of cabinet notes or the number of committee of secretaries notes or the number of uh, uh, policy notes that one an official can examine really determines his caliber there was further reorganization of the central secretariat between 1919 and 1947 we had a central board of revenue that's created that continues to this day as direct taxes and indirect taxes the agriculture research council was set up the department i serve in administrative reforms was set up way back in 1919 and uh, in 1930 we had the very illustrious vp menon serving in this department as an office superintendent 
1937, we had the Department of Labor. And uh, by 1935, the Ministry of External Affairs also had a separate political department which handled the Indian political service. And uh, the Second World War necessitated defense coordination, food department was separated, and uh, further expansion of the Central Secretariat was witnessed. In 1947, India had 19 departments, and we also had a pyramidal organization, secretary on the top, two deputy secretaries, and undersecretaries. Thereafter, joint secretaries were introduced, they became a regular feature in the ministries, and uh, additional secretaries were appointed, uh, mostly in the 21st century, to deal with the expansion of public business. So there was vertical movement of files across the various sections of government. And Curzon observed that files were represented a regular pilgrimage. They moved from one department to another in the same secretariat. They also went from provincial government to the Secretary of State and the Council. In fact, he does observe that uh, a file had meandered for almost three and a half years, and I thought this should be a quote I could say. It wandered like an uneasy spirit through the departments of the government of India until at length it came to me to be exercised and laid. Between 1947 and 1956, uh, there was further expansion. We had 28 departments. There were central administrative offices, a cabinet secretariat, ministries were created, planning commission was created. And uh, we, uh, the government invited Paul Humphrey Appleby from the Maxwell School of Public Administration, Syracuse University, to undertake a survey of public administration in India. When you see uh, currently the number of ministries and departments and government stands at 85, and the most recent being the Ministry of Cooperation, Department of Fisheries, Skill Development, Ayush, a whole number of uh, new ministries have come up uh, depending upon the uh, needs of governance and also the aspirations of the citizens. The Indian Civil Service, this is a service that uh, was created as a management cadre and uh, continued uh, for almost 200 years. And uh, it started in the middle of the 19th century. And the East India Company initially nominated youth to writerships. So they were the European elite who were trained at the Halliburry Company's training college. And uh, it was largely director's patronage. But uh, by 1853, the competitive examination was introduced because several administrative reformers pushed for a competitive examination because that represented a worthy method of selection uh, of officials to higher levels. So uh, Thomas Macaulay was one of the first civil servants who uh, said that uh, the civil servants should go out by 25 and they should have a degree from Oxford or Cambridge. The whole emphasis was on general education and thereafter on law. So uh, Macaulay Committee of 1855 says that the English jurists were men who never opened a law book till after the close of a distinguished academic career. So when you enter the gates of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, the first subject you're taught at great length is the Indian Penal Code, the Code of Criminal Procedure, the Indian Evidence Act. There's a great deal of emphasis on uh, uh, observance of the rule of law and understanding of law. And what you notice at various stages of your career is that uh, knowledge of law is a vital ingredient of the Indian administrative service. So a board of control for which to conduct the examinations was established and legal education was made mandatory. But uh, a large number of the successful candidates were still from Oxford and Cambridge. And they were covenanted ser uh, civil servants. They would start, enter into a covenant with the company, start their bottom as young men, and then gradually rise to higher positions. So uh, I joined in 22 and now it's been 33 years and I've gone through various stages of a career. So when I see that was how uh, young civil servants were always designed to go through various levels in government. And uh, the reconstitution of the civil service occurred into executive and judicial branches. So uh, those officers who underwent judicial training went on to become district judges, and those who underwent executive training went on to become district collectors. So for the first time by 1918, there was a shortage of officers felt and Indians were nominated into the Indian civil service. Thus began the Indianization of the Indian civil service. And a federal public service commission, which is now the Union Public Service Commission under the 1935 act was created. And we currently have three services, an all India service, 
a central service group and provincial services. So the All India services were recruited by the Secretary of State. They would serve at any part of India, assigned to provinces, come to government of India, go back to the states. And then the central services were those which dealt with uh, the subjects of the central government, foreign affairs, railways, post and telegraphs, customs. And then you had the provincial civil service, which could be promoted into the Indian civil service over a period of time. And uh, the after 1947, the Indian Administrative Service was created and the Federal Public Service Commission was replaced by the UPSC. So that is the first part of my talk today, 1834 to 1947. And 1950 to 1990 was a period of uh, regulatory governance. And uh, the principal areas of administrative reforms were seen as accountable, citizen-friendly, grievance judicial should be timely, uh, transparency was, should be there, integrity and motivated civil service, result-oriented public administration was a lot of focus. And we had more than 50 commissions and committees to look into administrative and civil service reforms. Forms. And uh, one of the one of my favorite reports is the A.D. Gorwala Committee report that dates back to 1951. Thereafter, we had uh, Paul Appleby's survey on public administration. Santanam Committee report is very important. It resulted in uh, the creation of the Central Vigilance Commission. Then we had the second Administrative Reforms Commission from 2005 to 8. Let me briefly go through these areas. Uh, one maxim that Gorwala says, which is relevant to this day, is what is not inspected is simply not done. And he advised that every secretary should spend at least half a day, preferably on Monday, to review the work of his own ministry. And uh, he said that unless officers are supervised, it's simply not done. The second major point that comes from Gorwala's uh, report on public administration is integrity is one of the cardinal and philosophical premises of good administration. And that is something that continues to this day. When you see the Indian administrative service in the 21st century, how, how much does it differ from that of the 20th century? And uh, Dr. Dugur Subarav told me, Srinivas, it, had, it does not differ too much in that, that the challenges that he faced are exactly the challenges that I face. Commitment to the larger public good against all odds. And he said that the IAS competency remains anchored in the foundational and non-negotiable values of integrity and credibility. You can outsource skill, but integrity and uh, credibility Credibility is something that you simply cannot outsource. How does decision making happen in government? Decision making happens on a delegated basis and channels of submission are well uh, outlined. In fact, a secretary was curious to know how his undersecretary was disposing files. And he said, let me call for them and ask for it. And the undersecretary submitted 38 files. And he wanted to know how the secretary would have disposed it. And the secretary merely said, it's a matter of your discretion. And it's left to you. And you did it. You do it the way you want it. But what happens in government is when Apple became and studied, he found that the handlings of a receipt uh, showed that 30 to 42 different handlings. So when a letter is received in government, it goes through several layers and layers. And he found that even within a single department, by the time it was disposed of, it required multiple levels of handling. Today, it's, uh, the, it's mandated that it should not cross more than four levels. Appleby also found that senior officers were highly overloaded and they needed support. So that was how a central secretariat stenographer service was created. He further said that organization and management units should be established in every department and an Apex Institute of Public Administration should be established. And that was how the Indian Institute of Public Administration has been established as the Apex Institute for Public Administration Research. Santanam gave a very important report. He looked into the causes of corruption and he said administrative delays, uh, uh, over centralization of authority, personal discretion, and cumbersome procedures. So he said, let me, uh, there is a need to create a central vigilance commission. And a CVC was created following the recommendations of the Santanam Committee report. The first ARC, the first Administrative Reforms Commission, uh, there was a lot of correspondence between the Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister on the need for good governance. And this was headed by a former Chief Minister of Karnataka, Mr. K. Hanumantaya, and he, over a period of four years, uh, tried to 
incorporate this idea of changing the civil service from a law and order agency to one uh, oriented towards development administration, which necessitated attaining a socialist pattern of society. So this was the mandate that the first ARC gave. And they gave 28 reports and very small reports, each one not more than 50 pages. And when uh, they covered a gamut of issues, appointment of the Lokpa, Lokayukta, uh, establishment of Department of Personnel and Administrative Reforms and the Cabinet Secretariat, strengthening of Zilla Parishads, interstate councils, and a motivated civil service. These were some of their major recommendations. There were also several committees that looked at the examination pattern and examination reforms. The first big one was the Kothari Commission under which uh, uh, I gave the examination. They introduced multiplicity of optional papers. Then the Satish Kandar Committee in 1989 introduced an essay paper and the marks for personality tests were increased. Then the Yogendra Alak Committee further enhanced the age of recruitment and also introduced multiple objective papers and an aptitude test. When you come to administrative reforms in 1990s, this was a phase where massive reform was witnessed. And the objective was economic liberalization mandated unshackling the Indian economy. There was cobwebs of bureaucratic control. So this needed to be smashed and uh, uh, private sector uh, had to be brought in as an equal player into the economy. So a board of industrial financial restructuring was set up, government formulated a number of new policies, uh, new industrial policy, policy, telecom policy, National Highways Act, Disinvestment Commission was set up, and of course, the big change, empowerment of Panchayati Raj institutions to the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments. We have these conferences of chief secretaries every year, but there are two conferences which were very important, and the 1997 conference was one, which resulted in uh, the creation of citizen charters as also development of the grievance to resettle machinery. And uh, thereafter, when you see it, uh, you have a right to information wherein which citizens have become an active player in government formulation. 2000 to 2014, uh, there was further reform in government and right to information became a reality and citizen became an active participant in governance. Public service acts have been enacted in all state, in several states and public grievance uh, portals have been established which enable an interaction between citizen and government across states and government of India also and institutional structures like the CIC and right to service commissions have been established in many states. So citizens have been significantly empowered through e-services and that is the big change that has come in. We also have a very strong regulatory model of governance. We have the TRI, the Security Exchange Board of India, the Pension Fund Regulatory Board, uh, Forward Markets Commission and IRDA. We have the Central Electricity Regulatory Authority, the Competition Commission. In fact, some of these were set up when I was serving as PS2 Finance Minister and uh, that was when the major changes happened. And uh, we now have an airport authority, a national highways authority, the Petroleum Natural Gas Regulatory Board, a Director General of Civil Aviation. And uh, as more and more private sector participation happened, the pay commissions started recommending there's a need to downsize government through corporatization of activities. So contractual appointments were identified in selected areas of operations. and. They also recommended new regulators to be evolved and enforced. The six CPC further said, please diminish layers. There are too many layers in the government structure. And uh, delegation with accountability was pursued and as also ensuring the best possible talent. So a national e-governance plan was formulated, which is implemented through a series of mission mode projects. And I'll deal with this whole of government approach in my later slides, which larger aimed at uh, reducing the number of trips a citizen has to make to a government office, reducing the waiting time in a government office, the digital land records modernization program, reducing uh, expenditure of citizens in dealing with government, and largely next generation reforms were pursued. Further, social audits were introduced. There was public vigilance and verification process. The Civil Services Day was, a National Civil Services Day was founded to be celebrated on April 21st every year. State of the governance reports were released and social accountability mechanisms came in. The second ARC, the second ARC 
uh, said that uh, it came with 15 uh, reports and uh, uh, nearly 10,000 pages of documentation and 1,500 recommendations. Many of them are very, very fascinating reading, promoting e-governance, citizen-centric administration, organizational structure of the government of India. Very important uh, recommendations have been made under each of them. And uh, the second ERC focused on the need to put the citizen first. And uh, it also said that uh, horizontal and vertical dispersion of decision making should be reduced. And uh, it uh, promoted a holistic view of ministries should be taken. There was a lot of uh, thoughts that went into rationalization and reorganization of the allocation of business rules. And uh, for example, I did, uh, I do have a, an example of Rail India Technical and Economic Services that was created that separated policy and execution. Also performance monitoring and evaluation systems were introduced. We had the results framework documents that were prepared and a performance management division was created in the cabinet secretariat. Between 2014 to 21, government adopted the maximum of maximum governance, minimum government. So there was rationalization of ministries and uh, massive scaling up of uh, uh, programs, particularly the flagship programs, as the state recast itself from a low capacity to a high capacity state. And the Weberian model of governance from a rigid, rule-bound, hierarchic characteristics was in need of massive revamping. So today we have a capacity building commission, we are looking at Mission Karma Yogi, a number of as a quest for a new public service, which is based on citizen-centric parameters has begun. Government introduced multi-source feedback for placements in senior appointments, the policy of a zero tolerance to corruption, the Lokpal has been operationalized, uh, interviews for group B and C posts have been abolished, self-certification for appointments, a national recruitment agency has been established, an IGOT platform is created for trainings. And how do you see the civil services in 2021? Recruitment is highly competitive. It's one of the most competitive examinations in the world. Training norms have become very stringent and there are constant evaluations on the capacity of civil servants to meet current challenges. There's also a need for uh, open, transparent, and accountable systems of delivery and effective management of public resources is mandated. There is a very strong institutional framework to fight corruption. There's a lot of focus on preventive vigilance with vigilance awareness weeks, orientation of PSU officers, the introduction of visits to rural India in foundation training, and a people's movement for uh, zero tolerance to corruption through e-pledges, integrity indices for organizations being established. And there is also strengthening of the audit and accounting systems, the amalgamation of the railways and general budgets, strengthening of audits of local government institutions uh, being pushed. And the Right to Information Act has been enforced across India. And the RTI has led to significant improvements in governance. And by sharing information, citizens have become a part of the decision-making process. So by embracing technology has become a key priority for civil servants. And there's a massive e-governance program. So you have Aadhaar, universalization of Aadhaar cards, Jandhan accounts, uh, construction of toilets that saturated. So building to scale and building to last, that has been the norm of governance. When you see the administrative reforms of 2014 to 2021, what you see is a broad basing of the Prime Minister's awards for excellence in public administration. Government has tried to uh, maximize participation, also reward the administrative innovation, innovators, and identify flagship programs which can be driven through innovations. National e-governance conferences being executed and awarded for uh, uh, e-governance models which are replicable and sustainable. E-office has been introduced under secretariat reforms, which brings tremendous transparency and the manual of office procedure that dates back all the way to Curzon has been modernized to enable the march to a digital secretariat. An assessment of states for the good governance index was been issued by the government of India. An e-services delivery assessment has also been formulated to understand how e-services have moved forward. 
and uh, newer versions of public grievance redressal portals have been created. So last mile grievance officers, today there are about 78,000 grievance officers demarcated on the portal. And uh, uh, grievance portals, there's a lot of improvement in terms of how grievance, grievances are being handled. District level grievance portals have been created, state portals being integrated with central portals, and uh, citizens are often contacted on the quality of their grievance redressal. There's also a massive change in terms of how leadership and governance have shaped up. And leadership makes uh, transformational changes. Leadership can bring about transformational changes and it matters most. How do you mobilize skill, people with different skills and backgrounds towards the common goal of advancing the cause of public administration? People have to unlearn old habits and learn new skills, particularly uh, e-governance, for example, the constitution may indicate the direction in which we are to move, but unless society accepts this change, the pace at which that change can be adopted would not be easy. One of the reasons why uh, such a massive change has been seen in scaling up of Aadhaar cards, Jandhan accounts, or technology seen in welfare state programs is because the rural societies have largely accepted it. Leadership also ha has individual character, national character, and it means uh, working with teams. So constitutional values which are deeply rooted in uh, high moral tones. So and, and, and in spite of massive e-governance models, the focus on the individual remains very important. Focus on a patient's journey in a hospital, a litigant's journey in revenue courts, a complainant's journey in grievance redressal. These are areas that I've worked over the last 10 years. And I noticed that the focus on the individual is very important while formulating larger public policy. So it's a marathon. There are no shortcuts to success. And actually, nothing comes easy in life. And hours and hours of hard work are required to sustain India's democracy. This is a quote from uh, the founder of Infosys, and I thought I should present it in this forum. Performance leads to recognition. Recognition brings respect, and respect enhances power. And this was something very apt. And he said, a good leader is one who works with simple business rules, easy to understand, easy to practice, easy to communicate, and reward innovation openness to new ideas, identify and promote meritocracy. There should be accountability, speed, imagination, and also simple principles, work regular hours, relax every day, stay disciplined in life. That was uh, That is something that uh, is uh, uh, the foundational skills of a leader. The second basic aspect, which Mr. Matthew referred to, ethics and governance. A sound value system actually differentiates long-term long players from others. And uh, the, one of the reasons why the Indian constitution is so strong is that it has, it's deeply rooted in high moral tones. And it, it actually promotes ethical leadership. And uh, Government must also demonstrate empathy for all its constituents while creating a knowledge-based economy. So there is focus on ethics, values, humility and decency, as also self-accountability and public accountability. Let me speak a few, uh, share, share a few slides on whole of government and how does this approach benefit uh, citizens at large. Whole of government is a movement from isolated silos in public administration to networks and digital platforms. And uh, this is necessary to meet the increased demand for depersonalized services and uh, accessible uh, public services. Nobody wants to stand in a line anymore. Everybody would like online services. And when you see what governments are doing across the world, they are focusing on going digital from United States to Japan, from Australia to Estonia, everybody is going digital. More and more services are being offered on digital platforms through digital identities. And uh, the United States has a social security ID, which dates back many years. So similarly, India now has the Aadhaar. And one of the biggest programs that was enabled under uh, in pursuance of Aadhaar was Digital India. And Digital India represented a campaign to create to transform India into a digitally empowered society. So high-speed digital highways and to ensure that government is open and governance is transparent. So there's been a massive scaling up of programs, e-transactions over 100 billion, 1150 services offered on a Umang app, 
Jandhan accounts to millions of Indians, massive digital consumer base, and above all, the technology practices being accepted by rural societies. So the biggest uh, change in terms of uh, welfare state programs has been the direct benefits transfer. And I would like to spend some time on the DBT. The DBT is a massive change. It enabled beneficiary digitization, deduplication of beneficiaries was av uh, avoided, electronic transfer of funds came into being with the PFMS platform. There was also data security, data privacy standards, and Aadhaar enabled payment systems meant that a, a beneficiary simply could not hide from the system anymore. So the DBT operates on two types. One is cash transfers, and the second is in-kind transfers. So these are used for food, fertilizer subsidies, and also for skill development, while the cash transfers are used for pensions, scholarships, fellowships. So more and more of these are being operationalized on the Umang app. Uh, for example, fertilizer subsidy and food subsidy were two of the most complex uh, subsidies to administer for government. And uh, today, fertilizer subsidy is based on actual sales rather than anticipated sales. So the actual sale captured on a POS device is, uh, is enabling calculation of the subsidy that is transferred by government to the manufacturing company. Similarly, One Nation, One Ration Card has transformed the way fair price shops work and authentication of uh, uh, using uh, POS machines with Aadhaar Biometric has enabled uh, that a, a, a beneficiary can receive his rations from anywhere and uh, his family members can also receive the full entitlements and a massive technology led uh, reforms in public distribution system has been seen. Another major reform area is the Passport Seva Kendra, and this is a massive overhaul. Those of you who would have visited Passport Seva Kendras would have seen them as massively cluttered and crowded institutions. Today, when you visit a Passport Seva Kendra across India, you would find it is divided into several compartments. The time at which you can go there is given. Uh, the time when you get your passport is, uh, is mandated. Police verification procedures has been simplified, and Passport Seva is at the door Similarly, government e-marketplace has made a massive change in terms of how uh, procurement is done and uh, with, with, without any direct interface between the buyer and seller. Further innovations, India Post represents banking without uh, banks and uh, doorstep banking through Postman has become reality. E-pensions provide a single portal for uh, pension disbursement, digital land is a massive change. When I see the Bhu Lake of Uttar Pradesh, I see more than two crore hits per day. It is a massive reform in terms of how land records in India are handled. Let me deal with secretariat reforms. And uh, we found central secretariat as also the state secretariat as largely paper cluttered offices. And uh, of course the pandemic has redefined governance with uh, large uh, officials, number of officials working from home. But it also man enabled a significant increase in digital decision making in the central secretariat. Virtual offices, web rooms, uh, virtual private networks were created the number of uh, officials using uh, digital signature certificates has gone up and e-office today has become a reality across attached offices subordinate offices autonomous bodies more than 30000 e-files being created every week it's a massive jump in the manner in which e-office is currently operationalized across the central secretariat so over 75 ministries on e-office and uh, virtual private networks provided up to deputy secretary level functional web, web rooms. It's a highly recognized initiative and the number of physical files vis-a-vis -vis the e-files has uh, come down and shrunk to about 30% today. Evaluation of the e-services has become an important part of governance and how do you evaluate an e-service? So these are the parameters on which an e-service is evaluated in whether a citizen can access it, the content is adequate, there's a status and request, uh, request tracking and service delivery, integrated service delivery. And uh, when we evaluated the e-services, we found that in terms of creating digitally empowered citizens, Kerala stands head and shoulders above other states. And they actually created integrated portals to which many services could be offered. When we looked at individual service portals, we found that uh, Haryana and Rajasthan have created very strong service portals. Uh, 
in terms of the ministry portals, the CBDT, the human resource development portals, the health and family welfare, a very, very strong service portals that have been created. One of the big areas of focus in government has been how do you increase efficiency in decision making? And this, as I said, uh, dates back to the second ARC, delayering, rationalization, and restructuring. So delayering, uh, reducing the channels of submission has been a very important part of governance. And operationalization of e-office version 7.0 across the central secretariat, the state secretariats, the attached offices has been a feature. And uh, a lot of dark is sent out and uh, every day in fact we used to send out 33 lakhs of uh, physical uh, letters and digitization of the central registration units has mandated that we can send out email receipts sms uh, receipts so huge volume of paper in government has come down and also operationalization of a desk officer system where uh, that official is the final authority with regard to handling a receipt so let me conclude here. Uh, as I said, leadership is all about the courage to dream big and courage to go against naysayers. In fact, uh, building a digital divide, and that has become a reality. We, of course, there is an internet rich India and an internet poor India, but how do you build this digital divide? India Post is one example where this digital divide has been effectively capped. And, uh, uh, how do you bring digital technology to make a difference to the citizens of India has been one of the driving forces of government. Internet has been a great phenomenon. Anytime, anywhere, governance paradigm has been brought in. And this is the other area at which you look, we're looking at, that every day human assets walk out of the door exhausted, and they need to come back enthusiastic and energetic next morning. And uh, the agenda 2022 is massive scaling up of state capacity. And this is what is the mandate of the Capacity Building Commission. How do you saturate government programs? How do you create that kind of a skill base where scaling up of capacity is there? And the way forward is integrated service delivery, e-literacy for inclusiveness, more and more people accessing common service centers, uh, using business correspondence, using e-mitras to ensure that e-governance models become stronger. A new India 2022, we have Bharatnet, Ethal, eSign, DigiLocker. This is how it defines the modern day governance. And at the same time, accountability levels have become very high. A one-stop portal is very important. and There exists substantial benefits for adopting a whole of government approach, but it also requires massive process re-engineering. And uh, a new India at 75, uh, the objective is to ensure that development becomes people's movement, uh, successfully implement the flagship programs, innovation, technology, enterprise, and efficient management. The core values of ethics and uh, fair administration remain valid. And new institutions, strengthening new institutions has become an important feature. So this is what I had for you today. And uh, let me thank uh, Dr. C.K. Matthew and uh, the senior faculty of uh, the Azim Prem, the university, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Srinivas. I think uh, that's a wonderful, uh, massive panoramic view of the Indian administrative uh, services transformation that you have sketched. I think, uh, you know, I'm sure there are many, many questions about it. Uh, many would like to know more about it, but I'm wondering actually whether I can somewhat misuse my moderator position and start uh, with one question. There are already two, three questions waiting for responses from you and Dr. Matthew. Uh, my question is, I think you have sketched out the uh, big picture and the major transformations that have driven uh, the way the services uh, looked at efficiency, uh, accountability, and other questions. I think there is also a question by uh, Mr. Chada uh, in the in the uh, you know um, questions asked box. Um, you know what really you see as the major um, dilemmas or challenges in this transitional process because. One is changing the rules of the game, but the other, as you yourself quoted in the uh, uh, in one of the slides, 
it is also about the mindsets it's also about the way the culture of the institutional space changes so as an insider as somebody who has navigated and also led the reforms what kind of uh, insight can you give on the challenges that one has faced in changing the administrative uh, you know cultures within the uh, government um, i then will of course go and probably try and filter out questions and come back to both of you one by one thank you uh, let me take this question uh, it, it's 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 a it's a very interesting question as to what is the big challenge in terms of how do you change administrative culture the first thing is as i pointed out leadership is very important and it's important to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your team uh, i do recall as chairman board of revenue a young subdivisional officer came to me and said that i have been promoted from the rajasthan tehsildar service into the rajasthan administrative service all my career i've written summary judgments and uh, that is one para judgments today i'm being asked to write issue based judgments my knowledge of the civil procedure code is very limited my knowledge and understanding of the rajasthan tenancy act and land revenue act need to be further strengthened it pointed out to a need for massive capacity building and in case you uh, unless they were trained in writing uh, comprehensive issue based judgments we found that uh, they were reluctant to sit in court one of the reasons uh, why revenue courts found themselves so overburdened was that a large number of them were reluctant or were uncomfortable conducting court on a regular basis so enhancing state capacity represents a fundamental need at a time when uh, accountability levels are so high transparency in governance is so high it is very important to enhance state capacity and uh, state capacity can only be enhanced by constant trainings by constant uh, knowledge sharing sessions uh, this was something that uh, th that interaction stayed with me and i do recall conducting a series of subdivisional officer capacity building workshops so that uh, officers uh, could learn from senior members of the bar i also found that not only this uh, need for capacity building remain within administration but it also was the felt in the young advocates many of them would come to participate as respondents rather than in cases where they were appellants and uh, they were very uncomfortable fighting a case before a senior lawyer and uh, capacity building of young advocates also became a very high priority when i saw work in the board of revenue so today uh, there's a india has a massive capacity building commission that is looking at various tiers of governance and uh, uh, how do you enhance state capacity uh, the uh, government is looking at saturation of uh, flagship programs and uh, that can only be achieved when there is massive increase in uh, state capacity also the challenge in terms of sheer numbers has increased when i was a subdivisional officer uh, i headed five sub five tehsils and uh, in five tehsils we had 1500 cases today a tehsil uh, a subdivisional officer has one tehsil and he is having more than 5000 cases in his court so the expansion when you compare it with a five tehsil subdivision from 1500 cases has gone up to 25000 cases so in terms of his responsibility there's a sheer explosion so that is the reason why uh, the number of uh, administrative units has expanded because uh, india had very very small number of administrative units today rajasthan has 334 subdivisional officers and still the case work which used to be around 1.5 lakh revenue cases has gone up to over 7.5 lakh cases so mm -hmm. that kind of explosion in litigation is being seen so if you want to improve justice delivery systems you need stronger state capacity thank you very well said thank you sir um uh, dr matthew there is one question for you so maybe i will ask that and then we will go back to the other questions for mr srinivas uh, mr chada is a little shocked by uh, dr matthew's defense of the british bureaucracy and he felt and i'm just cutting short the entire question to the final point is deeply disappointed that a senior person like him remains in the grip of our collective stockholm syndrome so maybe it's a little provocative but probably i thought you would have a response to him and then we'll move to other questions to 
Mr. Srinivas. As you said, this is certainly a provocative and abrasive question. But uh, uh, let, me, let me just put it in the right context. Mm. I began my presentation by saying that I am making a controversial statement. Yeah. Number two, I said very clearly that the, the allegations of Shashi Tharoor and Dalrampal, where he portrayed India as being raped by the British, repatriating the profits, leaving India impoverished, all that is there. My only point was when the British left, they had certain institutional instruments in place in governance, which includes our assembly Lok Sabha system, which includes the union list one, you know, the, the, continue, the concurrent list and the state list. That system was very much there. The legal system, the high courts and the district courts and the Supreme Court, all these were instruments put in place by the British, which we are still using even after 75 years. And when the question came to whether we should retain the civil services or not, there was arguments on both sides. Ultimately, the stand taken by Sardar Patel held, and it was passed by the parliament also. There is no alternative to the administrative system. I'm reading it out. The union will go. You will not have a united India if you do not have a good All India service, which has the independence to speak out his mind, which has sense of security that you will stand by your work. If you interpret this in a way that I am supporting the rapacious nature of the British East India Company, then I am I'm sorry, you are completely wrong with what I said. There is a lot to be done. As Srinivas pointed out, reform is an ongoing process. Good governance, as I keep saying, is not a destination. Good governance is a journey. Yeah. So you have to keep moving on that track. In no way am I saying that the kind of practices practiced by the East India Company is, is to be applauded. Certainly not. But they did leave behind certain instruments of governance and administration, which we still hold good and which is delivering the services. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Srinivas, I'm picking up a question on reforms, whether they are effective. Mr. Prabhu had a question. Lokpal and Lok Adalat are also ineffective. Why, according to you, is the question. I'm asking whether we can say whether reforms are effective uh, or how do you see the reform process that happened so far? Well, they are extremely effective. And I did give examples of uh, massive scaling up uh, in programs that was witnessed was only possible because India adopted a digital uh, e-governance model. And uh, those models enabled uh, this kind of significant scaling up. Uh, direct benefits transfer is a game changer. Aadhaar enabled payment systems have become a reality, as I said, in terms of the massive challenges in administering food and fertilizer subsidies, there's a lot of uh, streamlining of procedures that is being witnessed. Uh, the uh, central secretariat, the state secretariats today when you visit, they look like modern offices rather than uh, cluttered with huge number of files everywhere uh, in terms of uh, archival records, you have digital archives, there's the e ablate that has been created. So, uh, and citizens have become a part of this journey. That, that is the uh, entire uh, massive change. Accountability levels of government have increased uh, tremendously because uh, there is a right to information in place. There is also uh, uh, grievance redressal portals and right to services acts which have been enacted in many states citizen charters are monitored for time bound service delivery so uh, the reforms have brought in a paradigm shift i'm sure uh, you would recall standing in a ticket uh, standing in a railway station to get a ticket it would take several hours to get a ticket uh, i used to witness patients uh, standing uh, to get an outpatient department consultation in aims from 1 a.m. in the morning for a 9 a.m. appointment. And when I digitalized AIMS, I found that the wait times had come down uh, to a mere one hour. Uh, not only that, the patient records could be digitalized. I was associated with two major Digital India programs. One is the e-hospital or the digital AIMS program, and the other being the 
the e-office program. I also had the opportunity to digitalize the Board of Revenue, and I find uh, that e-governance is the way forward for the nation's progress. And uh, that, that exactly can make in systemic reforms. There's also an observation about uh, the FX institutions of the Lokpal and the Lok uh, uh, Adalats. The Lok Adalats are very effective. We do have run in uh, Prashasan Gaonki out or revenue campaigns every year. And the quantum of disposal in revenue campaigns is very large because people go to the village, senior officers go to the village. In fact, not only in Rajasthan did I see it, but also I saw it in the case of Jammu Kashmir where a back to village scheme was done, where officers go and do night halts in villages and uh, dispose of huge volumes of uh, work. Uh, the Lokpal is an institution that has been established. It is, it is an institution with considerable mandate and stature. And uh, uh, I'm sure uh, in, in the times to come, it would establish itself as India's paramount institution for fighting corruption. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, um, SN Prasad has a question. Given the increasing complexity and technicality of modern governance functions, could you elaborate on what is being done to resolve the generalist versus specialist and administrator versus uh, server dilemmas? As I pointed out, the Indian Administrative Service was founded as a generalist service, and uh, that dates back many years. And that that uh, uh, officers with generalist education, and that that I come with an engineering background, Dr. Matthew comes with an English background, but we did the same job. But we were both trained in law and, uh, and the objective was to enforce the rule of law. And uh, that, that was the mandate given to us to ensure that justice is done and justice is seen to be done and we adopt ethical values. So uh, the gen even when we entered the service, uh, we were trained hugely in law. Uh, the modern day governance has become highly uh, uh, specialized in that, that uh, Regulatory models of governance necessitate greater and deeper understanding of subject-specific laws. For example, the telecom regulatory authority requires deep understanding of the telecom sector or the petroleum sector. There is The learning curves are extremely steep in some of these jobs. And uh, the IAS, of course, remains uh, as the management cadre manning several senior positions in government, uh, having to face the challenge of uh, uh, taking up these steep learning curves on every job. I do recall my interaction in 2008 with Dr. Zubur Subarao when he had assumed charge of Governor RBI. And he told me that uh, Srinivas, it's a very steep learning curve. I asked him, how do you find the job? And uh, uh, I asked him why, you've been finance secretary of India, you have a PhD in public finance. But he said shifting from fiscal policy to monetary policy was a huge change that uh, he had experienced. And, uh, <coughs> and trust me, I spent many years in the International Monetary Fund and also in uh, planning department in the state and finance secretary expenditure. Then I was shifted to health and I found it a massive scaling up because suddenly you had to deal with huge number of people, patients and institutions which were uh, which needed massive changes. And it happens every time you, if you come to the central government from state government, you suddenly find yourself working on union lists and you go back to the state government, you work on a state list. So every job where there is a change, there is a steep learning curve. And that is why it needs hours and hours of hard work to sustain India's democracy, as I pointed out. Indeed. Thank you. Um, Rupala Saxena has a question on the magistrate powers of the district officer. The separation of the executive and judiciary is a tenet that binds the structure of democracy. Don't you see the magistrate powers of the executive, district officers, revenue courts, etc., as a contrasting feature to that? Uh, the uh, the Indian Penal Code has been given completely to the judiciary. What uh, the district officers currently handle are certain provisions of the Criminal Procedure Code, which deals with maintenance of law and order. So those are essential for uh, uh, strong governance. 
And in terms of uh, revenue law, the Code of Civil Procedure in its uh, introductory paragraph itself says that this, uh, uh, the, the specialized provisions of the tenancy laws or the land laws of the state will not be, will, will, will prevail over the general provisions of the CPC. So uh, unless an officer knows land issues, it's very difficult to adjudicate uh, land cases. That's what I found having served as a subdivisional uh, officer, adjudicating huge number of cases as a district collector, handling some of the most complicated cases. And then as a chairman who conducted bench every day, I found that you needed a deep understanding of law land issues and trying to empathize with the litigants journey in revenue courts. So revenue courts are so, handle some of the really complex litigation, particularly in a state like Rajasthan, which uh, was created by merger of several princely states and several land acts. Thank you. Uh, Arvind Kumar has a question. This session was very insightful and informative, etc. But sir, I would like to know that as per the second ARC report, as mentioned, there is increasing gap between public servants and the citizens, especially in rural areas. What is your view on it? And what is the way forward for that? I did mention about this aspect of an internet rich and internet poor citizen. And that gap has been uh, attempted to be reduced significantly by the common service centers, by banking correspondents, by e-mitras who provide doorstep deliveries. And today, India Post represents one such uh, success story where in which over 46 million citizens have benefited from uh, banking at the doorstep. So uh, the common service centers, in fact, uh, I went back to Rajasthan in 2017 after seven years on central deputation. And what I found in the rural landscape of Rajasthan, having traveled about 8,000 kilometers was that uh, the rural landscape had changed and it was marked by uh, digital merchants, e-mitras, banking correspondents in many places. And the reform, the technology reform was accepted by rural societies. Today, you go to a village and ask how many citizens have a Jandhan account, and every every woman in the village hand will go up. Similarly, you uh, ask a, a, a village how many of them have Aadhaar cards. Everybody has an Aadhaar card today. So the benefits of technology have been accepted by rural societies, and that has led to this uh, massive uh, Aadhaar-enabled payment systems to become a reality. Six crore Indians have benefited from One Nation, One Ration Card. So it's a huge number of uh, citizens who have benefited from adopting this technology reform. Thank you. Um, Dr. Srivatsa Krishna has a question to Dr. Matthew, but uh, he appreciated excellent presentation by Srinivas Garu. Question to Dr. Matthew. A comparatively uh, recruited civil service exists only in about a dozen countries out of 184 countries. When do you see India moving to the UK kind of spoil system where the senior executive come and go with the political executive in power? whereas the middle junior executive are permanent? Uh, actually, this is a question which has been uh, troubling the civil service for some time now. India has always believed in what is called the permanent bureaucracy. You enter at a very young age, 24, 25, and you continue till 60, 65. The purpose seems to be to generate memory. Mm -hmm. That means a person who is working in a field over 30, 35 years, remains a source of permanent knowledge to the government. He's not shifted up to four years or five years when the government changes. He shifts from department to department, ministry to ministry, but he retains a general kind of treasury of uh, memories which helps him in governance. That is, the, that is the principle behind a permanent bureaucracy. What the US and probably not many other countries, what they do is that at the highest level of the bureaucracy, there are some 4,000 odd posts which the US president himself decides. When the new president comes in, he appoints these 4,000 people in key positions. When he leaves, these 4,000 people leave. They are the ones who take the policy decisions on behalf of the president, on behalf of the national government. Now, you can argue all kinds of things. A person who has a stake only for four years or five years, how is he going to perform duties that will 
actually remain permanent and bring about permanent change in the world? Yes, you can ask, ask this question. At the middle and the junior level, which Mr. Srivastava has mentioned, they remain permanent. That means you enter at a lower level, you can rise up to a certain level of the bureaucracy, not beyond that. So I, I don't have any ready-made answer to this. Question is that, do we want to go into a US kind of system, which also has so many difficulties and so many problems and so many charges of corruption and so many ways the system is not working? Or do we go in for a system where there is a permanent memory system? You can argue both ways. But at the moment, I don't think we can, the jury is still out. I don't think we can come to any conclusion. Uh, Rohini has a question. Why is there no reward for performance, no motivation to performers and still seniority uh, carries more power? That's one question. The second one is no one can aspire to get higher as per senior should be promoted before the junior gets his turn. Is there no need to change this? These are both our service related matters. Well, uh, in terms of if you're a performer, you are recognized. And uh, I did point out to the restructuring of the Prime Minister's uh, Awards for Excellence in Public Administration, where there's been uh, the number of nominations that would come was 85 in 2014. Today, we get more than 3,500 nominations. So every district collector is encouraged to submit an innovation that he has undertaken or uh, submit the work he has conducted in the flagship programs. And, uh, uh, and in case his work is outstanding, he's rewarded by the prime minister on April, on the National Civil Services Day, which is April 21 uh, of every year. So uh, there is recognition for work. There are also national e-governance awards. There are awards that have been set up by various ministries. I myself was an awardee for the National Productivity Council when the president of India gave for highest productivity in rainfed agriculture, Digital India awards, there are Kayakalp awards. Uh, there are a, a series of awards that are there which recognize uh, the sustained hard work that an official puts in. Uh, as far as uh, level jumping is concerned uh, with regard to hierarchies, the civil service works on a hierarchical principle. There are uh, bands in which uh, you work. And uh, for example, the joint secretaries, there are uh, about 10 years, uh, 10, 10 years of seniority work in the same band. And uh, at additional secretary, there are about four or five years which work in the same <clears> band. And at secretary, there are four to five years which work in that band. Similarly, in the state government, at various levels, there are certain uh, bands in which you operate. And within that bands, you move. And uh, uh, also, it is important because unless you are experienced enough, responsibilities cannot be uh, shouldered very easily. You need, uh, for, a si for a country of our size and complexity, and uh, the sheer uh, uh, responsibility in terms of uh, decision making, you need uh, a certain amount of experience to uh, conduct a job successfully. So it's it's if you need that experience to go into that particular band, that's what I'd like to say. Right. Thank you. Um, Rishi has a question. In today's scenario, the role of civil society is continuously increasing. Does the increased role of civil society represents the failure of pre-existing bureaucratic system? No, actually they work together. In fact, uh, the society has become a partner in India's developmental governance model. And you find more and more uh, organizations because the right to information is a reality. It empowers the citizens significantly. Also social audits have become a reality. I do recall the first time I saw uh, was when I visited Dev Dumri and they had put up a board which said that uh, the quantum of expenditures that were incurred on a particular bridge. And uh, they said, this is uh, bringing transparency into governance. So I went back and published a document which said so much money has been released to each of the water users associations. And uh, thereafter, when I see the current day right to information movement, uh, I noticed that uh, civil society has become an integral part of uh, modern day governance. Thank you. So Naresh uh, Saxena has a question. Why is there a wide gap between evaluated and reported data, uh, such as on sanitization, malnutrition, et cetera? Why are no reporting 
correct data, I guess. That's the point of question that he's asking. Uh, I, I guess, I think he's speaking about the periodicity of data publications. And uh, what I do notice is that uh, the periodicity of uh, data availability is, uh, it takes time to produce collate data and to ensure that the data is analyzed and presented in a coherent form. Uh, I, as Secretary Planning, I used to head the Directorate of Economics and Statistics, and there was a significant gap between uh, data collation and data publication. Uh, what we do, what we, the nation brings out on a timely basis are the economic surveys, the, uh, the economic statistics that are there, and uh, but in terms of census reports, it goes into a decadal period. There are some reports which are being brought out on biannual or triannual basis or even uh, five yearly basis. So in terms of uh, data availability, there is a periodicity to data being available. That, that is something that uh, I, I'd like to point out. Right. Thank you. Um, but there, but there is, is a... real time data, but there is real time data available right. on e-transactions and that is the ethal the ethal measures real time data with regard to the number of digital transactions that are happening every day and uh, those can be uh, accessed on a real time basis right okay uh, the next question is uh, vp raja has a question will you like to comment on the changing the changes taking place on the concept of political neutrality of civil servants? The, the Indian Administrative Service remains a neutral and anonymous service. And uh, the relationship between the political executive and the uh, civil service, uh, civil servant is well defined in the allocation of business rules. There's a channel of submission, there are standing procedures uh, that uh, define how governments work how the state secretariats work, how the central secretariats work, protocols are well established. So I think essentially it remains uh, 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 a neutral and anonymous civil service and uh, the leadership role is mandated with the elected representatives. Right, thank you. And uh, there is a very personal question, but I think maybe you will have an answer because there is also some kind of a matter on the communication. This is by Ritika Ramasuri. Um, Mr. Srinivas, my father is a victim of vaccine scam. The hospital has been shut down, but we don't know uh, if they administered uh, saline solution, diluted vaccine, etc., etc. And the final point that she's actually asking is, do you respond to civilian emails on your official government email address? Or uh, if I register my grievance on the CPGRA MS portal, what kind of action can be expected? Well, uh, the the response in this case would be given by the concerned state government uh, and the respective hospital. So if she registers a complaint on the CPGRAMS or on the state portal, she will get an official response as to what exactly happened. And uh, my condolences are with her uh, for her loss. It will be examined uh, very thoroughly. Right. right. Yeah, thank you. So, Ms. Pranav has a question. Ms. Srinivas, how do you feel the pandemic has been managed by the government and what would be the key takeaways from the last one and a half years experience for public administration in general? I did point out the significant reforms that came in that was necessitated in the pandemic, particularly in terms of digital governance practices and uh, the sheer expansion of e-office, creation of virtual web rooms, virtual private networks, and uh, the entire quality of digital governance has undergone a massive change. I've also seen uh, young officers, particularly the district collectors, who have stood in the front lines of duty and have put uh, the nation above self in almost all cases. Right. Thank you. And I think we can probably take uh, one question further. The civil service is required to follow directions from the political executive. However, in case of excess on the part of the political executive, what can the civil service do? 
the whole framework works within the system of law and uh, the mandate uh, is to implement uh, the the constitutional law that has been given and that that is something that uh, has been uh, mandated to the government function right thank you we had just completed the 10 minutes extra time there are about three or four questions left my sincere apologies to those who posed those questions but i think um stretching beyond perhaps is not most advisable at this point and i think we nearly had 2 hours plus conversation so i would like to very sincerely thank both mr sinwas and dr matthew for a very insightful and a very panoramic view of the transformations that are happening in the indian administrative service reforms and i'm sure uh, there are many who have posed very interesting questions and both have responded quite adequately well and we are very grateful to both of you sir thank you now uh, that was uh, quite a journey on understanding the history and evolution of the services something that uh, seems quite opaque for those of us who are on the outside i should hope that for those who are part of the system this serves as a refresher and and are presented with thoughts to mull over and for those of us who are outside um something to uh, we look forward to and learn more about thank you mr shrinivas for your extensive work and valuable insight thank you dr matthew for the uh lovely and if i may so, say so myself charming introduction to the lecture uh Uh, thank you, Professor Kathrala, for your moderation. We are grateful for your time, and thank you and thankful to the public lecture series by Azim Prindji University for bringing us these ever so valuable conversations um, with such regularity. Uh, thank you, audiences, for uh, tuning in and for all those interesting questions. And we do have a ton uh, more to go, but uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, get in touch with the speakers later and. Uh, get more of your questions answered and all i have to say now is thank you and good night and see you next time thank you thank you Thanks. thank you thank you, thank you. absolutely